This morning, from the Palace of Westminster, we bring you a unique blend of pageantry and politics, as King Charles III gives his first King's speech as monarch from this historic throne. It's the state opening of Parliament 2023. <laughs> Well, a very good morning. What a day ahead. Welcome to our wonderful surroundings here in the House of Lords. And in just under an hour, His Majesty the King, accompanied by the Queen, will arrive at the Palace of Westminster. It's such an honour for me to be here this morning. And what a day it will be. So fascinating, and so important. For the first time in some years, we will see the return to the full pageantry and pomp for which this event is so globally celebrated. It's going to be carriages, horses, military guards of honour, all the royal regalia, a spellbinding mix of symbolism and spectacle, all rooted in our past. So enjoy the splendour of the occasion. But the future is all important today as we look at the cold, hard politics as a general election hoves into view. So this is, in every respect, a momentous day. In the House of Lords, look at the magnificence of the chamber and such expectation. The peers and the guests have already started to arrive to secure their seats for the biggest events in the parliamentary calendar. And uh, you don't get in if you're a peer without the uh, suitable attire. And it really is a case of first come, first served as well. Now, once on the throne, there it is, uh, the monarch's throne, and we have the consort's throne course beside it today. The King will unveil the government's legislative programme for the session ahead. And as I say, it's a huge political moment and it's a first for Rishi Sunak, his first state opening as Prime Minister. We will be discussing all the wider political contexts later in the programme. Now, once the imperial state crown is on, the political gloves are well and truly off and we will get a real sense of the battle lines over the next year or so, the issues, issues that will win or lose the election. So to explore what all of this, and there is so much of it, actually means, and to explain to the uninitiated, and I am frankly relatively uninitiated, are my guests. I'm delighted to welcome Baroness Heyman, the First Lord Speaker, the presiding officer of the House of Lords, a position that she held for five years, author and Daily Mail writer Robert Hardman, who knows a lot of stuff, and uh, the BBC's political editor Chris Mason, Lord Mason of Millbank, with his regalia, the simple sword of truth. Because <laughs> that's what we do, the simple sword of impartiality. Quick word from all of you. If I, Baroness Heyman, if somebody's like flicking through the TV channels this morning <clears throat> and chances upon this and thinks this is all a bit bewildering, what does it mean? Well, it is bewild bewildering, but it means that the politics, the day-to-day -day politics, the real life of politicians and what's going to happen in legislatively for the next year is there. But it's there amidst this tremendous ceremonial uh, and a huge amount of pomp and pageantry. So everyone gets very excited at being part of the pomp and pageantry. <laughs> uh, but it's actually really symbolic in lots of ways because it's the only time you have the House of Lords, the House of Commons and the Sovereign in one place at the same time and that's the body that makes law. You can't do it without all three. Absolutely, we've got lots of time to talk, so sound bites from both of you if I, if I could. Massive day for the King. Robert. Very big day for the King. It's the one day of the year when we see a monarch looking like what we think of as a monarch in a crown, coming in a carriage. This is the constitution in human form, if you like. It's, mm. it's, we, don't have an, we have an unwritten constitution, but we see it all play out today. Well, for now, we can get a one-word answer from you today. A lot of politics. A lot of politics <laughs> after a lot of ceremony. I've just walked past, Nikki, the, the poshest car park in the UK right now, which is all of the ambassador's cars parked outside yeah. Parliament. That sense that those here from around the world representing their own countries come to Parliament, to our Parliament on a day like this, to see this ceremony. Ceremony, yes, but 
shed loads of politics to follow. Yes, to be here is such overwhelming. It's so beautiful, so truly majestic. Let's have a look at what's happening today. The King, accompanied by the Queen, will arrive at the Sovereign's entrance in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach. And uh, from there, they will make their way up the Sovereign's staircase and go into the robing room. Now, there are no cameras in the robing room. That's where they will dress in the robes of state. And King Charles III will put on the imperial state crown. Quite something to behold, only seen at the state opening of parliament and also coronations. Uh, the king and queen will then process in state through the royal gallery, which is now packed with specially invited guests. And then they will head through Prince's Chamber, which features portraits of the Tudor kings. I was in there the other day, just incredible place. There's also a very um, imposing marble statue, see it there, of Queen Victoria. And then the King and Queen will go from there to the chamber of the House of Lords. And once he's taken his place on the throne, then the signal will be given to the Lord Great Chamberlain to give a signal to Black Rod to summon the Commons to hear the speech. And exactly halfway between the Lords and the Commons, roughly where Black Rod will be standing, is uh, Tina de Healy, who's there for us this morning. X marks the spot. Nikki, Tina. This is the heart at the centre of the Palace of Westminster, which connects both chambers. As you can see, it's filling up fast, and that's because it's one of the best locations to watch proceedings today. Very shortly, the Speaker's procession will pass through Central Lobby, and then we'll hear the police inspector shout out the traditional cry of hats off strangers. A stranger, by the way, is anyone who isn't an MP. After that, Black Rod, who is the King's representative in the Lords, will make her way to the Commons to summon MPs to hear the King's speech. As she approaches the Commons door, it slams shut in her face for ceremonial reasons. It's one of the most famous rituals at the state opening of Parliament and is said to symbolise the independence of the Commons from the Sovereign. I will be here throughout the morning speaking to MPs, getting their reaction to the King's speech. Thank you very much indeed, Tina. And the, the Queen Alexandra's state coach is, as you can see, departing Buckingham Palace with a precious and uh, constitutionally uh, very important uh, cargo there because we have in there the imperial state crown, only seen at coronations and also state openings of parliament. We have the cap of maintenance, uh, insignia of royalty and also the Sword of State, which is one of 141 crown jewels, two-handed sword dating back to 1678, and first used at the coronation of uh, James II. Now, as, as I've mentioned, this state opening is a full return to all the magnificence and uh, splendor of previous state openings. Return to the spectacular uh, traditions that we haven't seen for some time. But what does it take to get ready for a state occasion? Well, here's the team at the Royal Mews in during pretty inclement weather last week, preparing for today's events. Today we are practising for the procession we'll be taking the Crown Jewels for the State Open of Parliament. A lovely wet morning in London. It could be raining on the day and we still have to take His Majesty and the Crown Jewels to the State Open of Parliament. Um, so even if it's raining, we still carry on. We need to practise, uh, get the horses used to the household cavalry and the household cavalry used to the carriages. Um, these are the carriages we'll be using this morning, um, which are just exercise vehicles. It's now presently half past six. Um, and the horses are all harnessed up, ready to go. So I'll go and get my livery on and we'll get everything put to. I'm responsible for all the horses here. We've got 33 here at the moment. Before we leave, I make sure that everyone's up to the standard that we set in the Royal Muse. We've been preparing for the last couple of months. Um, all the state harness has to come out clean, polished. The carriages would have been clean, the liveries would be clean. The procession at the moment, we've actually got quite a lot of the youngsters going out. Um, our youngest horse is actually five years old. 
our oldest one would be 17 years old. Um, and it's trying to marry up the younger ones with the older ones to give the younger ones some confidence. And then we've had lots of drills in around Windsor and London to get them out in the crowd so they get used to people. On the day, I will be uh, driving the Queen Alexandra State Coach, um, which traditionally takes the Crown Jewels to the Palace of Westminster. It's one of our favourite jobs. We haven't done a state job for, for a little while, so there's tension in the yard, there's excitement, so lots of preparation, and um, it's, it's going to be a great day. I'm Lewis Ecclestone, and I'm a liveried helper here at the Royal Mews. This is Ronnie Mead. Uh, he will be my outriding horse for the state opening of Parliament. Ronnie Mead is eight years old this year. He loves a treat, and he's just a real big, just gentle giant. He's a lovely character. Uh, so on the day of the state opening of Parliament, I'll be a outrider in front of the grey six-horse team that will be pulling the king. Ronnie Mead will be paired up with Friary Girl um, as his matching horse to be outriding with on the day because they are very similar in height and they are both very brave horses that will lead the whole procession. So we have to get them uh, bathed, groomed um, as much as they need, especially with the grey horses, it's a challenge to keep them white. It's brilliant, it's great fun, they've all got such characters, they all like things done in a certain way, so you just get to learn each one individually. First time I've done a state opening in Parliament before, um, it's not been done for a while, so lots of pressure, but excited. What a magnificent, beautiful animal there. And we're seeing the aerial shots at the moment. As I've been uh, finding out, the state opening is all about formality and traditions, one that uh, dates back to the failed gunpowder plot of Guy Fawkes in 1605, is the ceremonial search of the cellars of the Palace of Westminster, performed by the Yeoman of the Guard. Slow march. The oldest military corps still in existence, founded by Henry VII in 1485. And uh, I like this. Their, their payment for their vigilance and diligence is traditionally a glass of port as well, which uh, is never a great idea before lunch. And rarely a good one after dinner, if you ask me. But uh, it's kind of a case of rude not to. And there they are. What a great thing to be involved with if you're a yeoman of the guard, um, responsible for guarding the interior of the monarch's palaces. There are 73 yeomen of the guard, um, all of whom are former warrant or non-commissioned officers of, um, of the British services. So, yeah, Robert, Robert Hardman, what a year it has been for the king. How would you assess it? Uh, it's been extraordinary, and, and if you think just six months ago, here we were at Westminster for um, in the area for, for the coronation. And today is, uh, aside from a coronation, I mean, this is the only time we're going to see Charles III wearing a crown in future. It's the only time we see all that, that's the, the regalia come out. In fact, if you go to the Tower of London today, there's actually a little sign in there that says, in use, because uh, these are, if you like, these are, these are, this is working regalia. Mm. Um, so we see all that. But, but at the same time, um, it, it comes at a very busy time of year. I mean, at the weekend, obviously, we're going to see the king um, uh, leading the nation in remembrance. Uh, it, it's it's an absolute central part of the of the royal calendar. And look at this. This is this is a central this part is... of the ceremony. This is the yeoman of the guard who we saw earlier taking part in that ceremonial search, um, uh, arriving there in the royal gallery. Not not to be confused, of course, with the yeoman warders who guard the crown jewels at the Tower of London. No, never get them muddled up. Never get them muddled up, Robert. Um, but this this is a day where I guess. He wakes up and he says, this is showtime. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's what monarchy is, is all about. I mean, you're going to see him on a throne in Parliament. Uh, he's, it, he's absolutely at the centre of things. Um, the last people to come in are going to be the, the MPs, the elected ones, and yet it's them who've written the speech he's going to read out. It's all, I mean, trying to explain it to, to if someone, as you said earlier, someone arrived from, you know, out of space, I think, what's going on here? But it's, it's how our constitution works. And, and he will have to read a speech. He, he, is, he hasn't... He'll have to keep a very neutral tone. He's had to learn that. He, he, don't forget, he did read it last year. He read a Queen's speech last year. 
uh, when the Queen yeah. was ill. A neutral tone is all important, isn't it, isn't it, Chris? Because there will be things in this uh, King's speech that he might not, if you've got him in a quiet moment with a glass of port, necessarily <laughs> agree with completely. Yeah, and I suppose that's the difference, isn't it? That's the difference with the, 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 the changing of monarch in the last year or so, that the, uh, the Queen's views were guarded incredibly and it was not known what she thought mm. publicly about a whole range of things whereas because Prince Charles as he was was in that role for so long and took public positions on various issues there is a greater sense isn't there of his his outlook and his worldview but on an occasion like this it is all about him reading what is presented to him as, as we were just hearing yes it's it's called the king's speech but it is written by the government he merely has to read it out knowing because of that mm. if you like uh, history of us knowing a, a sense of what uh, what he thinks on particular issues environmental, environmental issues, issues, issues yeah, yeah. Um, that he'll need to maintain that very that very neutral tone one of the bills that we can anticipate him reading out in the next hour or so is this idea of this this annual licensing for north sea oil and gas which some people might say would possibly stick in the craw but um, he's just delivering the government's legislative program of course and uh, looking at the royal staircase at the moment, we can see Baroness Heyman, the household cavalry, the dismounted detachment of the household cavalry, the, the party there taking their position in readiness for the king's arrivals. We have the lifeguards in their red jackets. We have the blues and royals on the, on the right with their blue jackets and, and red plume. And the Princess Royal will be here today. She is um, a colonel of the Blues and Royals, and also a gold stick in waiting. Uh, what, what I found really thrilling the other day, Baroness Heyman, was being on that staircase and seeing, and you, you might just have got a glimpse of it, on the stones, there are spur marks on every stone going up and down, and I thought, there's the indelible mark of history and, and tradition and time. So I, there are lots of spine-tingling moments as you walk around this place. Yeah spine tingling and, and pit of stomach moments as well if you're involved. <laughs> I mean always when I was at the top of those stairs mm. because part of the role of Lord Speaker was to go down and greet and it might have been a head of state when Obama came, you the same setup there and you're in robes on state opening and mm. they're heavy robes and they're not your robes and they might be too long for you and that fear of not performing your bit of the ceremonial, tripping up, doing something wrong, yeah. um, is there and the personal as well as the, oh my God, what am I doing here? How did I come to be part of, of this? And it is, it is spine tingling, you're yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, uh, not for, and it takes six weeks to organise. We'll get on to that. It's a massive team effort. There are many firsts for today's ceremony. Uh, and, um, uh, oh, look, we're just seeing the honourable uh, core of the gentlemen at arms coming into the Royal Gallery as well. And they were created by um, Henry VIII as his personal bodyguard. Robert is uh, agreeing with me. I'm very pleased that Robert <laughs> is agreeing with me on that. And they were created as his personal bodyguard. Of course, Henry VIII was a man occasionally prone to some paranoia. So I'm sure his personal uh, bodyguards looking like they that. They call themselves the closest guard. They do. They call themselves the closest guard. Listen, there are many firsts for today's ceremony, and one of the great officers of state is the Lord Great Chamberlain. This guy is important. He represents the sovereign at the Palace of Westminster and is about to experience his first state opening. And here he is with Tina de Healy. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by Lord Carrington. How have you been preparing for your first state opening as Lord Great Chamberlain? Mainly through a lot of rehearsals yesterday when we practised every element of the, uh, of the state opening. Uh, but it was all done in various sections. So I'm rather looking forward to today when we see the whole thing done as a whole. Tell us about the key duties you're performing today. Uh, my key, key duty is to greet the Sovereign, to uh, well, actually first of all to greet the Crown and then to greet the, the Sovereign and then to lead the Sovereign together with the Earl Marshal into the Chamber of the House of Lords and then to lead the procession back through the Royal uh, Gallery to the robing room. 
you have a very important job of, of carrying the imperial state crown. Have you rehearsed doing that? I certainly have rehearsed doing that. Very important indeed, uh, as it's quite heavy. Uh, and uh, it needs to be placed very, very centrally on the table that you will eventually see. And tell us about your uniform. My uniform was made in 1911 for the coronation of George V, uh, when my ancestor, who was Lord Great Chamber at the time, changed the uniform from being black to being scarlet. Uh, and this is the very same uniform, and uh, with very small modifications, mainly to the collar, uh, it uh, is the same one. The and it key fits you. Is, it fits, but the key is different. Can we see the key? You can see the key. Turn around, brilliant. Uh, and that key gets you into where? And the key gets me into the Houses of Parliament, the Palace of Westminster, which is my responsibility. Well, wishing you the best of luck. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Lord Carrington. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's uh, Rupert Carrington, Lord Carrington, uh, son of uh, Peter Carrington, who resigned from Mrs Thatcher's cabinet over the Falklands War. Uh, he, uh, he resigned as a, as a matter of honour, which is uh, something you, some people say you don't see so much of these days. But a, a great family and uh, one of the great aristocratic families. And here we have uh, Queen Alexandra's uh, state coach edging towards the sovereign's entrance with the regalia. Um, Robert, the all-important regalia. Yeah, the, the, the three key things, as we heard earlier in there, are obviously you've got the cap of maintenance, which is a sort of symbol of sovereign authority, uh, which is always held on a, on a, on a wooden stick. Uh, the sword of state, uh, symbol of royal authority in there at the, at the centre, will be the imperial state crown. It's actually the number two crown. The St Edward's crown is the crown with which monarchs are crowned at coronations, but we only see that at coronations. This is the crown, if you like, the the day-to-day -day crown. Uh, it's still pretty impressive. Mm. It's got the second largest diamond in the world in it, Cullen and Two, and it's also got the Black Prince's ruby and Elizabeth the First pearls. So it's quite a impressive piece of uh, of, of, of heritage. Yes, uh, 2,628 uh, diamonds. Uh, so yes, as you say, powerful and ancient symbols of royal authority, which will be put on display in the royal. Gallery and those uh, there's the king's barge master there and watermen. There are still 24 watermen, and that's one of the most ancient positions, the position of uh, the king's barge master. And it's redolent of of history, isn't it, Baroness Heyman? Because it's when the the monarchs used to travel to Parliament, state opening of Parliament, from their residences in you know, Hampton Court and also Greenwich and the Tower of London, and there uh, they came by the river. Absolutely, and you know, this ceremony starts, I think, in the 14th century, in the 1400s, actually, and then has changed century by century as things alter in terms of the balance of power between Parliament and the monarch. A lot changed after the Civil War. And that's Mark Appleby, who is the crown jeweller, who took the crown out of the state carriage, and now he has the cap of maintenance. And uh, we also have uh, the sword of state coming as well. And uh, the crown is being held by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Vernon. And uh, the cap of maintenance will be carried by Admiral Sir George Zambellis. And the sword of state by Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Seagrave as well. It's actually the other way around. It's the um, cap of maintenance carried by Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Seagrave and the sword of state, Saint George, Sir George Zambellis, Admiral Sir George Zambellis. The sword of state, um, I think I mentioned earlier on, first used in the coronation of James II and VII. And now they proceed up the sovereign's staircase. And the Earth. The crown will be taken briefly, a brief detour into the regalia room where it will be given a slightly superior cushion. And, but it's a very important part of this that the, the state regalia are, are put on display, Baroness Heyman, in the Royal Gallery. That's all about it. It's like this, this is the royal authority um, embodied. Absolutely. Just as the mace embodies 
the monarch in Parliament when Parliament is sitting in the House of Lords. You can't sit unless the mace is there, but the mace won't be there today because the mace represents the monarch and the monarch's going to be there in person, so you don't need the mace standing in for them, if you like. And it's the thing that always worries me slightly about getting the balance between this wonderful ceremonial that everyone just wants to watch and say, oh, look at that, look at that, mm. what on earth could a cap of maintenance be? Um, and, and people enjoy it. It is splendid and wonderful and exciting to be part of, but if you know nothing about it, it can seem just a little bit Gilbert and Sullivan, yeah. you know, and, and it's terribly important because the separation between the constitutional monarchy and the power of parliament, which this ceremony actually embodies, is absolutely central to our democracy. Yes, I mean, some people having seen the, the, the Lord Great Chamberlain's wand might be thinking, yes. you know, some people watch it, what is this, Harry Potter or House of Lords? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of phantasmagoria about it. And uh, there is the crown coming up the sovereign's staircase. And what, what a great shot from, uh, from our colleague on the camera there. Um, 31.5 centimetres high, set with 2,628 diamonds, 269 pearls, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds, four rubies, and it was at the bottom of the stairs handed over by the barge master to Lieutenant Colonel Michael Vernon and now will be handed to the aforementioned Rupert Carrington, Lord Carrington, who is the Lord Great Chamberlain. You can see the cipher on the table, the letters CR woven into that beautiful fabric. Before it was ER and before that GR. And now a bow to the crown from the Lord Great Chamberlain. And there it is. It's quite something, Robert, isn't it? It is, and it's actually quite heavy. Mm. Uh, it weighs around five pounds. Um, and the late queen always used to have it brought round to the palace the night before so she could get used to wearing it um, because it is quite a burden on your neck. It used to occasionally slightly surprise people when they suddenly found her wearing a crown. But uh, uh, it, it, you, you, you do have to get used to it. And you also, you can't really look down when you're wearing it. You have to look ahead, so you will see that the king... Have oh, you worn it? <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I mean, experience. Well, well I, right, I do right, remember right. the late queen saying well, that if you, if you look down, you're in trouble. Yep. She, right. she actually said it could break your neck because it's yes. so heavy. Yeah. So you have to hold the speech up and look at, look at it. And the cap of maintenance has been placed there. Um, traditionally, the, the cap of maintenance, and maintenance comes from the, the, the French for, for hand, so it's a cap that is always taken in hand and never on the head. And that was presented to monarchs by popes offering, uh, sorry, by, by popes to monarchs. Yeah, that's right. And now, um, let's have a look around the House of Lords. It's Floella Benjamin, I think we're going to be seeing as well. Uh, you can do a bit of spotting for us here, Chris. You know yeah, who. Have a look. OK, how are you there? Yeah. Go on, take it, talk us through it, Chris. And we have a former First Minister of Northern Ireland just uh, in, in front of her, Arlene Foster. Michael Gray, broadcasting giant. Indeed. He's worked for them all. There's going to be some interesting stuff on uh, broadcasting today, it is said, and on the media. There is the indeed. There's a, there is a media bill, uh, there is a media bill uh, coming up uh, to try and uh, reflect the changes in the, the broadcasting, uh, broadcasting landscape. This is the Herald's procession now in their medieval uh, tabards. And this is a role that's existed since the, the 15th century. Original, originally, there were messengers uh, sent by monarchs to um, convey messages or proclamations. And they also marshaled and introduced uh, contestants at tournaments, like a bit of jousting. I am all up for a bit of jousting. And uh, they're coming down the sovereign staircase there in readiness uh, for the arrival of the king and queen. So you, like, you look at your best thing to say something. Robert. Well, I, it was just nice to see the, 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 the heralds there. I mean, people, yeah. people, people um, often wonder, you know, what do heralds do? But as you said, they, they originally, they marshal processions. They're still in charge of processions here in Parliament. And oh. they, uh, they're, they're, there are three ty types of heralds. Um, people always wonder, why are some called Perseverant, some extraordinary, and some called heralds? But we don't need to go into that now. Perseverant. What's a pers? What go on? Perseverant. Spelt perseverant. They're yeah. the most junior form of uh, herald. 
and uh, they, uh, the, the, the senior one is Guard the King of Arms. And now they're experts in genealogy and, and history and, and heraldry, funnily enough. <laughs> and the sort of person that if you were with them, you'd want to be talking and talking and talking and you'd still not be doing enough talking. There's the Queen and King in the Imperial State coach. It has back been in an palace. extraordinary amount of ceremonial, if you mm. think of the mm. funeral of the late Queen, the coronation, and now this. And uh, the Diamond Jubilee. And the Diamond Jubilee. Oh, sorry, the Platinum Jubilee. Platinum, yeah, 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 immediately yeah. before. The National Anthem is being played. Tell us about that coach you were saying. Well, that is the Diamond Jubilee State coach. It's the most modern um, of all the coaches, and uh, it's also the most comfortable. It's the only one with central heating. <laughs> it's also got um, hydraulic <laughs> suspension. Um, but at the same time, it's it's a sort of it's almost a, a sort of four-wheel museum of British history. It's brilliantly uh, put together with. It's got it's got a, a it's got a sliver of a Bletchley Park hut. It's got a sliver of Scots. Uh, um, sledge, it's got um, the, the, the crown at the top, it's from HMS Victory. I mean, it's an extraordinary piece. Yeah, the Diamond Jubilee State Coach. Um, the King the king and Queen attended their, their first state opening together 10 years ago now, didn't they? 2013. Mm. Um, He's, well, the King himself, I mean, he, I, I suspect there's nobody else in the chamber today mm. who's seen this event going as far back as him. He saw his first one as a teenager when he came in 1967 and Harold Wilson was Prime Minister. I doubt there's anybody else in there today mm. who was there in 1967. Mm. Um, but yes, he, he was his first one with the Queen and obviously uh, last year he was, he was reading it out for the first time, although, as we said earlier, that was a Queen's speech. He was stepping in mm. for... Uh, for the Queen's. This today is the first King's speech in a very long time. You've got to go back to the reign of George VI. No, uh, well, it's the first King's speech since uh, 1950. Yep. And uh, when uh, uh, King, uh, King George VI sat in the monarch's throne beside him in the consort's throne and there are times, Elizabeth. There are times mm. when monarchs can't do it. So 1951, mm. the king was ill. In the old days, if a monarch couldn't be there, then the Lord Chancellor would read the speech. But the, the queen changed the rules last year so that actually it wasn't the Lord mm. Chancellor, it was the heir to the throne. Mm. And in um, 1950, when King George VI read the uh, king's speech, Clement Attlee was Prime Minister. Have you heard Colin Attlee, you're far too young? No, I, I, no, I didn't cross paths. No? <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary, though, isn't it, just watching the pictures? And I don't say this to be flippant, but it's the, the greatest fancy dress show you'll ever see, yeah. uh, but which emphasises that distinction between what Walter Badgett, the constitutional historian, talked about, about the dignified and the efficient yeah. parts of the, the British constitution, that you see the dignified, the, the uniforms, the history, the depth of the history that we've just been reflecting on in the last couple of uh, minutes, and there's plenty more of it to come uh, in the next little while, followed by the return of the noise of politics and that distinction between uh, the, the, the dignified, the, the ceremony, the monarch, and then where the power really lies in our constitutional settlement, which, with it, which is here, here in Parliament, in the, in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And even between the two houses, I mean, I did go to my first state opening when Harold Wilson was Prime Minister. I hate and there's to a Lord say. Great, the Lord, goodness me. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> that's the, that there's a Lord you. Great uh, Chamberlain, Lord Carrington, taking the Imperial State Crown, charged with this duty, and he's taking the State Crown into the robing room, yeah. which uh, is, of course, indicative of the fact that uh, the King and Queen's arrival is, uh, is imminent. And uh, they're on their way. Um, they will be with us very, very shortly, or they will be with everybody very, very shortly. And uh, the King's speech will be um, possibly in about 20 minutes time, something like that, because after they arrive, they go into the robing room for around about 10 uh, to 15 minutes to, to get ready. And uh, there are various processions which we'll be following as everybody else gets in line and gets in, in position There's for this There's still very... a bit of mystery in there, isn't there? There is a bit of mystery. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of majesty and a little bit of mystery. And some people might, as we said earlier on, see it as somewhat bewildering. And if you join as a, as a young member uh, the, the House of Commons 
and you look, it must be, uh, there's a lot of shock and awe going on, isn't it? Oh, there really is. I mean, I think I've kicked around here as a reporter for around about 20 years, and I still can't mm. walk up the steps out of Westminster Tube Station and look up towards the tower that no. holds, holds Big Ben without a little wow moment. Yeah. And similarly, walking these corridors every day and still getting lost, by the way, after mm. uh, rather a long time. You, 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 because, because there is there is history in every, in every stone, in every wall, in every corridor, and then it obviously comes out on show uh, on, a, on a day like this in a, in a very obvious and and transparent way transparent in its uh, in its sort of range of colors and histories even if some of the the detail is something that um, well we need our experts to talk us through because of because of, because of its depth mm. it is it's an extraordinary place to be and it's extraordinary surroundings to be to be working in what's quite interesting is that uh, the royal gallery there which which is has that wonderful blue mm. carpet the king and queen would, would only ever walk, walk on blue carpet, but that's specially carpeted for the occasion. Absolutely. Yeah. If blue carpet, then you're in the royal bits <laughs> of the Palace of Westminster. Red carpet, House of Lords. Green carpet, House of Commons. And there's Penny Mordaunt, who's the Lord President of the Council. This is the Lord President of the Council's procession. And Robert Hardman, of course, she was uh, much lauded. There's a, there's a word for <laughs> much lauded for her contribution to the coronation, wasn't she? She was as Lord President of the Council. She was probably more central, more, more had, a, had, a, had a better view of everything than almost anyone else except the Archbishop of Canterbury. She was certainly the only person who could see the anointing, if you like, at the coronation. She was holding the sword of state on that occasion. That'll be held by someone else today. But it's a reminder of, of, of how ancient some of these positions are. Yeah. So she is. Um, President of the Council procession and everybody rises now for Lord Speaker, Lord uh, McFall, of course. Who Did you see that never existed? What didn't the, exist? The Lord Speaker's procession. That never happened. When you were Lord Speaker? The... Well, no, it was created for you. when the position of Lord Speaker... Right. Well, well, for the Lord Speaker, not <laughs> for me personally. Um, but. It became absolutely seamless. You see how it's happening. You'd think it would have been happening for three centuries, but it actually started in 2006. That says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, things, the, things are added on over the years. And we made it up yeah. the night before. Exactly. <laughs> oh, exactly. Right, okay. Like all good traditions. <laughs> the rehearsal Tell me the more. Night Tell me about. So basically, it was a great honour for you, of course, because before I, I think I'm right in saying that the proceedings in the House of Commons were presided <coughs> over by the Lord Chancellor. Am I right in saying in that? In the House of Lords. In the House of Lords. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And they created the, the role of uh, Lord Speaker, and you were the first person to. Um, occupy that role. Talking of uh, Lord Chancellor, now of course in the House of Commons, yeah. Secretary of State for Justice there, wearing the wig today, there's uh, Alex Chalk, KC MP. Tell us about Alex Chalk, uh, Chris. In, on the, the, the Liberal wing of the Conservative Party, um, defending a, uh, this is where the roaring return of politics comes in the middle of a moment of ceremony, uh, defending a very marginal seat against, uh, against the Liberal Democrats in uh, Cheltenham. Um, highly regarded, was doing what's known as the morning round this morning where he bounced from one TV studio to the next, setting out the politics of what's to come mm. before doing the very much, uh, the very ceremonial role before the return of uh, politics this afternoon. And actually a good amount of the political discussion to come will be broadly on his beats. There's going to be a lot of focus about crime and justice when we hear from the King shortly and then in the debate that will that will follow. Don't, don't, don't be you know, wary about or, or, or shy about coming forward on political issues because it's what it's all about today. Yeah. It's the pomp and it's the pageantry <clears throat> and it's the politics mm. as well. Oh yeah, the two are entirely linked. Yeah. yeah. And many people are watching for the, for the, the great show and the pomp and the pageant, pageantry and many are, some people inevitably be saying, come on then, what's going what's gonna to mm. be in this speech? But it's the intertwining of, of both as part of the constitution, whether you you know, approve of that or not, it is uh, quite a magnificent sight. And the Vice Chancellor himself will deliver uh, the speech to the King in a purse, in a big purse. Tell me a about that. Yeah, and this is part of what used to go on, that the Lord Chancellor went as the representative of the House of Lords together with the Lord Privy Seal mm. down to greet the monarch and then come back and his job was to present the speech to the monarch on the throne and then <clears> go backwards 
down the stairs mm. because until a few years ago it was considered disrespectful to turn your back on the monarch. So some very elderly gentlemen had some very difficult <laughs> down the stairs The backwards. Queen got very worried about this, And the actually. Queen got worried about <laughs> it and she actually made it perfectly clear that she was very relaxed if people went down safely, even if they had their <laughs> well, back to I, I hear I hear Alex Chalk might attempt the, the reversing manoeuvre. Well, I, 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 yes. I actually I was very privileged to have been here yesterday and I watched some of the rehearsal and he, he was worthy of Strictly Come Dancing. He was worthy <laughs> all the way down, you know, a little, little shimmy backwards. Yeah. But, you, but you would do. And the procession there currently going down Whitehall with the household uh, cavalry in the in the state coach i wonder what the king will be thinking now this is it and the queen indeed let's talk about uh, yeah. queen camilla uh, important role we haven't had a queen consort um taking part in uh, a state opening uh, as you say since 1950. um so that that's that's a big thing it's a it's been an extraordinary year for her i mean obviously you know, the king uh, was born and grew up expecting this moment um, but she really came into it relatively late in life she won't be wearing a crown queen consorts don't wear crowns today she'll be wearing uh, a diadem, uh, but she will be in her coronation dress, the Bruce Oldfield dress that she wore at her coronation. I think for both of them, as they're coming out Whitehall, as you mentioned just then, uh, I think there, there will be a, a sense of sort of deja vu, a sort of reminder, because they were in this carriage. It was in this carriage they came to their coronation six months ago. Um, and, and uh, you know... This... Yeah, they'll be arriving at uh, Victoria Tower, the Sovereign's entrance, but there's, a, there's, another, there's another real sense in which they are arriving, isn't there? Yes, I mean, for, for, for them, it's, it's, it's effectively, it's a sort of, you know, the, 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 the uh, novice period, the, the apprenticeship, if you like, it's over. The, you know, we're now fully functioning monarchy, this is what we do, um, and, and the state opening really is the most important part of the calendar, and we, as we just saw the carriage go past the cenotaph there, that's another important part. I mean, he, you know, he's now got three state visits um, under his uh, belt. Um, and he's, as Chris said earlier, he's off to, uh, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's going abroad again. Uh, just back from... Yeah, yeah, to the, to the yeah. climate summit and he's just, And he's, let's not forget, he's yeah. also head of the Commonwealth. He's just paid his first Commonwealth visit last week to Kenya. Um, and he's so negotiating some very tricky issues when he goes to uh, former colonies. Isn't he at the moment? There are there are, there are many bones of contention. Of well, course. he of course because he's there both as head of the Commonwealth, mm. but he's also there as, as you know it was these were all parts of the British Empire. Well, they're not all. I mean, the interesting thing about the Commonwealth and is is that now increasingly the, the countries joining it were never part of the mm. British Empire. So it's a, mm. it's it, there's a lot of history he has to uh, has to deal with as well as a, a day like today where you he, he, everyone's dressed up in a, in a historical way, but as Chris says, looking forward to to a government program and the first extent of the politics as well. So the first. Uh, King's speech for the for the king, albeit he, he performed that deputising role last time around, around 18 months ago, and then for for Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, his his first King's speech, the first chance he has had as prime minister to set out a legislative programme with the, the prospect for him that unless this and the autumn statement, the uh, budget in all but name in a couple of weeks' time, uh, can help revive his fortunes, his fear will be it'll be his only chance to do this, given where the uh, opinion polls are. And one of those increasingly uh, limited moments that he has as Prime Minister to seize the agenda, because a day like this allows a government to seize the agenda for all of the reasons that we can see uh, on screen, to try and um, grapple back some, some support, haul himself and his party uh, back in a sort of northward direction in the uh, opinion polls, to try and ensure from his perspective that the the next election's as competitive as it as it can be because politically he's undoubtedly under the car. Mm -hmm. And the King's procession approaches very shortly. We're going to be hearing the anthem. is that all mm, the pomp and circumstance is with the king and the monarch who reads the speech and all the power 
is with the Prime Minister who writes the speech. Mm. And that just encapsulates a constitutional monarchy that works. Back to that distinction that yeah. we've been discussing. It's so evident in the pictures and the sounds of the morning. Exactly. The band of the Scots Guards uh, with the national anthem there. And the Guard of Honour provided by F Company of the Scots Guards, commanded by Major James Drummond Murray. fanfare signalling their majesty's arrival and now the royal standard will be unfurled replacing the union flag at the top of Victoria Tower Greeted by the Lord Great Chamberlain and by the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk, Lord Great Chamberlain there with his uh, white wand of power, and Earl Marshal, Duke of Norfolk, preceded by the heralds as they come up the sovereign staircase. What do MPs make of this, Chris Mason? Plenty. Whatever their wider views might be on uh, monarchy or the nature of ceremony, the, the, because it's so dripping in history, uh, it's impossible, I think, even for those who perhaps kicked around at Westminster for a very long time, not to at least briefly be absorbed by the, the ceremony, the sense of occasion, the sense of ritual, the extraordinary uh, outfits and regalia and traditions. And this outing roughly annually. There's all Black of Rod as well, the Lady Usher of the Black Rod. So. Yeah, all of these titles and job descriptions that have centuries of, of heritage to them. So I think, I think plenty of people kind of get, even if only briefly, swept up in a bit of that, knowing that just around the corner, because of the very nature of this as an illustration of the uh, distinction of powers within the British constitutional settlement, that the, mm. the roar of political noise is just hours away. In, in days gone by, Following Queen Camilla, those, those two women there would have been referred to as ladies-in-waiting. But it's uh, the Queen's choice that they are now to be referred to as companions. So, you know, inches of modernisation. Yeah, as we were just reflecting a few minutes ago with the, uh, the, Lord, the, the development of the Lord Speaker role, that, that sense that... Um, Parliament has these traditions that can go back centuries, but also ones that might only go back 10, 15, 20 years, but which kind of slot into the uh, slot into the kind of architecture of tradition mm. and then are carried on from there on. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, uh, as the Queen and King get ready uh, for the state occasion, I'd like to welcome my next guest. You will have noticed there in the long shot there are different people here, the magic of the occasion. Um, and we're going to address the politics of the day. Representing the three biggest parties in the House of Commons are Chris Philp for the Conservatives and Kirsty Blackman for the Scottish National Party and Sir Chris Bryant for Labour. Welcome to you all. Great to There's have a lot of Chris's. A lot of Chris's. We've got three, <clears throat> three Chris's and a Kirsty, which is all good. Um, and uh, we are going to be um, hearing this, um, this King speech. Um, we basically know what's in it. We know the parameters of it. Is it? As uh, I mentioned earlier on, is it a kind of a kind of? There's lots of starting guns, but is this another starting gun for the next election? Yeah, it kind of is. As you say, there's plenty of them. I, I'm trying to sort of almost limit the number of times I use the e-word election uh, when I find myself on the television and radio for fear that I use it every single day and that a viewer oh. might reasonably think, yeah. "Oh, just come back and tell us when it's actually on," yeah. because we don't know precisely when mm. it's going to be. But it's going to be in the next year or so, and this is one of the remaining moments for the government to seize and grab the agenda because that's the very nature of a day like this that the government can do uh, just that in setting out its legislative and there's the cap program and, yeah the cap and sword being handed there to the uh, uh, the peers in the royal gallery can lord, lord stirrup in a wee minute chris i just want to mention that lord 
and by all means you can, but there's Lord Stirrup and uh, Lord True there. Lord Stirrup was Chief of the Armed Forces and Lord True was, uh, is a Conservative peer and he was uh, a John Major's uh, favourite um, speechwriter. Sir Chris Bryant, you were going to say. I was only going because you asked about tradition and what mm. MPs make of it all and um, I just love the fact, if you, we'll see the Imperial State Crown in a few moments, the Black Prince's ruby on it mm. was worn by Henry V at mm. Agincourt. Mm. St. Um, St Edward's uh, sapphire was buried with King Edward the Confessor in Westminster Abbey in 1066. And then, in the 12th century, they got it back off him because they wanted to put it in the crown. I, the fact that the crown is only made in 1937, it's it, that sense of tradition being renovated and our history. I think I'm a Labour MP, but I'm afraid I love it. What's the Labour MP but all about? I th you know, well, I think some, some, people, some people expect, you know, Labour MPs to think that um, tradition is, uh, it doesn't matter. And because we do want to change the country, I, I want to press the reset button in this country on so many different things. But I just think I... This stage. And, and the Royal College of Needlework, um, have, you know, do a, an amazing, amazing job and, and they are celebrated around the world. And instantly, we've got some wonderful flowers here. I would just point out, I'm the Shadow Minister for Creative Industries, that the floristry industry is worth £2.4 billion in this country. Blooming marvellous. Absolutely. Bob so, but, but Kirsty, I mean, Chris says, I am Labour, but I kind of know what he means, but you're, you're a Scottish National Party. Do you have a but? Do you love this? I'm not going to say a but, I'm just going to say, People are sitting at home unable to pay their electricity bills. You know, they're sitting at home trying to work out how they're going to get to the end of the next week. And then you see all of this pomp and ceremony. You hear about these sapphires and rubies and things. And it just feels so far removed from daily lives and the daily struggles that so many people are going through. I get that tradition is important. I'm not trying to say tradition is not important. But right now, I'm not sure that this is the right image that anybody wants to be seeing because actually they're so worried about how to get to the end of next week, you know, and, and this is just... It's, not just a bit of a, how... it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrifyingly terrifying world at the moment. And a lot of people will hear exactly what you're saying, but others will say, look, in, that, in, the, in, the, in the terrifying climate, this is, this is actually a, 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 a reminder of stability and of, and of permanence. If people want to be happy and enjoy this ceremony, mm. absolutely, I'm quite happy for them to do so. What I'm worried about is the fact that an awful lot of people will be thinking, Parliament doesn't understand us, Parliament is really far removed from our daily lives, and this doesn't do anything to help that image. Well, this is a very important perspective. It really is. Chris? Well, look, I'm a bit disappointed by what Kirsty said. Today is about uh, ceremony, it's about history, it's about traditions going back centuries. It's one of the reasons why so many people from around the world come and visit the UK uh, as tourists, for example. Now, clearly, we're going to get to the politics later on today. Uh, we're going to talk about issues like cost of living. The government has spent like £100 billion in the last year supporting people at these difficult times. Difficult not just in the UK, but around the world. But today is about celebrating our history. It's about a ceremony that has its roots in the mists of time. And I think it's something we should be uh, quite grateful to have in this country. Very few other countries in the world have these sort of traditions. And I think on the rare occasions uh, we have these sort of ceremonies, we should, I think, cherish, cherish them. Well, an interesting conversation, the mists of time and the myths of time. And uh, we are going to see something that actually happens every day. We're heading towards the, the speaker's procession when the speaker walks through the uh, central lobby uh, before the common sits. In invented during the Second World War. Um, and, and I think because of the, the, the fact that the House of Commons had been bombed and, and so the Speaker had to process from Speaker's House to the House of Lords where the House, where the House of Commons was sitting. My point is, because he's absolutely right, of course, the vast majority of people in this country are worrying about whether they can pay their bills and when they go to Morrison's, um, how much the, um, the cost of bread is and things like that. And we've still got inflation running at 6.7%. Uh, I haven't got a single constituent whose pay has risen by 6.7% in the last year. We'll get on to all, all this. It's a absolutely vital that we do. Well, that's surprising because Wave Chris is running above that. Pants off strangers, which means let's be quiet just for a second. The speaker's procession, led by doorkeeper Andy Richford, Sergeant at Arms, Advana Oyet, and the speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle.
sergeant at arms Agbana Oyet settling the mace. And uh, we leave the comments now as they go into prayers because we never see or hear the prayers. So uh, this is so, this is so interesting, Kirsty, about the, the ceremony. Though. What about that particular ceremony, which is r recognition of the, uh, the power of the, and the independence of the commons? Does that, is that something that you, when you see it, when you're part of it, you feel, yeah, this is good? It, you know, as I said, I quite like tradition. I quite like ceremony. Mm. I don't have a problem with it. The, the issue for me is the kind of expense of these things and how different it is from everyday life. The Speaker's Procession doesn't cost money uh, to run the Speaker's Procession. As you said, it happens every day. Um, it's a regular occurrence. It's the start of the day. It's um, a, a, a recognising and representing that the Speaker is that unique figure within the House of Commons, it's got a separate level of power there. But that bit, hats off strangers, that's wrong, isn't it? Because it, it, it refers to a time when members were allowed to keep their hats on and MPs sitting in the House of Commons can wear a hat during the... Uh, and, in fact, government ministers had to wear a hat in the old days. Um, it doesn't recognise the fact that women aren't meant to take their hats off at all. Um, and it says that, that you're either a member or a stranger. Every other country in the world doesn't have a stranger's gallery or a stranger's bar. It has a public gallery and a public bar. I don't understand why we have to maintain this bizarre um, language from a from a. So if you had your way, there so would... I would change that bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there are mm. there are sensible things that we can change. Mm. What do you got, Chris? Isn't it just part of the history, though? I mean, given that the hats thing, I guess now is is not something that would affect most people because most people aren't wearing hats. Why not keep that? Why not keep but that? If that a woman is sitting is standing in there, is she meant to take a hat off? You think change that, do you? <laughs> well, I do, I, no, I don't. I, it's, not, it's a nonsense. It's like when Nancy Astor was first elected but, to the House of Commons, they had a whole debate about whether w what women should have to do about wearing a hat. But you can Look, this you, isn't you, the most important thing. Oh, in no, the no, 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 but, 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 just, no. But you I can cherry pick. We, you can cherry pick. Yes. You say, what's, what's all that Harry Potter stuff with a big wand all about then? You can say, it's all right, though, isn't it? Would you change that? There are bits as well? and pieces of it. Well, I don't mind. It's just that I think there's a. If you, th if you think about how Parliament is viewed at the moment, and this is a parliament in which 25 MPs have... Everyone's, everyone's standing up, Lord Great Chamberlain. So the procession of state is now underway for the state opening of Parliament 2023. Just to remind you, the first for His Majesty the King, Charles III, as monarch. And uh, the King has already seen two prime ministers during his reign, uh, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. And um, there was the Earl Marshal. There's Lord True carrying the cap of maintenance and Lord Stirrup former head of the armed forces, uh, with the sword of state. <coughs> and uh, as they leave the royal chamber, they enter the princess chamber. As you can see on the walls, paintings of Tudor monarchs, and curiously of Philip II of Spain as well. He was uh, married to Queen Mary. And a wonderfully impressive and somewhat imposing marble statue of Queen Victoria as well. The Princess Chamber leading to the House of Lords and all stand. King taking his place on the Sovereign's throne. Next to Queen Camilla. And he will 
Now talk. My lords, pray be seated. And the Lord Great Chamberlain raises uh, the wand. That's a signal to the Lady Usher of the Black Rod, who now makes her purposeful way to the House of Commons. It's a very long walk, actually. I did it the other day. And she had a great vantage point where she was standing. Where she was, you can see the seats in both chambers. And she will knock on the door three times. And you can see where the bash marks over the years. Close the door! That has happened. Mr. Speaker, the King commands this Honourable House to attend His Majesty immediately in the House of Peers. Here comes Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker. <laughs> Nifty footwork. <laughs> with Black Rod, Sergeant of Arms ahead of them. And now... It's the awkward small talk walk. This is the, 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 these are the kings and queens of small talk. Yes, right? but I like that bit of the tradition. Which bit? The knock, slamming the door in the face of, yeah. of Black Rod, because that's there because of 1642 when King Charles came yeah. to try and seize five members of the House of Commons because he disagreed with them. And, the, and that's the last time that the monarch yeah, entered a, the chain. It's a strong message of independence, isn't it? Absolutely. For the, for the House of Commons. Uh, that, well, this is the bit we all look. Right, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, uh, uh, Chris Mason, you're very good at lip reading. <laughs> There's a few what smiles now. I wonder if they're asking about how the children are and all, all that kind of thing. The tradition tends mm. to be that you follow your opposite numbers. You've got the, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition there. He could be, he could be talking to him about AI, uh, something that in, engages the Prime Minister, or he could be talking to uh, the Leader of the Opposition about Arsenal. You know, yeah, it looks like got quite a lot to say. Maybe he's talking about VAR. The, the thing, uh, the thing <laughs> they've got a long conversation. <laughs> the, the thing is, um, they do talk to each other and we try and, you know, infer what, what they're thinking and how they feel about each other. Sometimes it's mutual admiration, sometimes it's a very friendly... When is it mutual admiration? Well, mutual admiration was back in 1932. All right. All right. No, I'm just making it up. <laughs> um, but also, that very often, there's, you know, you see people who think, oh, they really don't like each other, and they end up doing podcasts together. Well, mm -hmm. these things do happen, yeah. don't they? Yeah. And also, I mean, you know, to make a point that I always think is worth making, when you perhaps only see snippets of the House of Commons at Prime Minister's Question Time, you know, there are a lot of friendships that exist across party and between parties be and all the rest of it, which then, hmm. you know, but that doesn't mean that in another environment you can't have a robust disagreement about whatever the order of the day is. I'm intrigued I'm seeing so many people who we know this is the last time they're doing it because they're not coming back after the election. How will they be feeling? Well, sentimental, I should think. I have an interesting story about this from 2001. What do I think? Lord Chancellor, Alex, the Right Honourable Alex Chalk, KC MP. The speech is in the purse and he will hand it to the King. Look at that. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, it is mindful 
of a legacy of service and devotion to this country set by my beloved mother, the late Queen, that I deliver this, the first King's speech, in over 70 years. The impact of COVID and the war in Ukraine have created significant long-term challenges for the United Kingdom. That is why my government's priority is to make the difficult but necessary long-term decisions to change this country for the better. My minister's focus is on increasing economic growth and safeguarding the health and security of the British people for generations to come. My government will continue to take action to bring down inflation, to ease the cost of living for families and help businesses fund new jobs and investment. My ministers will support the Bank of England to return inflation to target by taking responsible decisions on spending and borrowing. These decisions will help household finances, reduce public sector debt, and safeguard the financial security of the country. Legislation will be introduced to strengthen the United Kingdom's energy security and reduce reliance on volatile international energy markets and hostile foreign regimes. This bill will support the future licensing of new oil and gas fields, helping the country to transition to net zero by 2050 without adding undue burdens on households. Alongside this, my ministers will seek to attract record levels of investment in renewable energy sources and reform grid connections, building on the United Kingdom's track record of decarbonizing faster than other G7 economies. My government will invest in Network North to deliver faster and more reliable journeys between and within the cities and towns of the North and Midlands, prioritizing improving the journeys that people make most often. My ministers will strengthen education for the long term. Steps will be taken to ensure young people have the knowledge and skills to succeed through the introduction of the advanced British standard that will bring technical and academic roots into a single qualification. Proposals will be implemented to reduce the number of young people studying poor quality university degrees and increase the number undertaking high quality apprenticeships. My ministers will take steps to make the economy more competitive, taking advantage of freedoms afforded by the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union. A bill will be brought forward to promote trade and investment with economies in the fastest growing region in the world. My ministers will continue to negotiate trade agreements with dynamic economies, delivering jobs and growth in the United Kingdom. My ministers will introduce new legal frameworks to support the safe commercial development of emerging industries, such as self-driving vehicles introduce new competition rules for digital markets and encourage innovation in technologies such as machine learning. Legislation will be brought forward to support the creative industries and protect public interest journalism. Proposals will be published to reform welfare and support more people into work. My government will promote the integrity of the Union and strengthen the social fabric of the United Kingdom. Working with NHS England, my government will deliver its plans to cut waiting lists and transform the long-term workforce of the National Health Service. This will include delivering on the NHS workforce plan, the first long-term long -term plan to train the doctors and nurses the country needs, and minimum service levels to prevent strikes 
from undermining patient safety. Record levels of investment are expanding and transforming mental health services to ensure more people can access the support they need. My government will introduce legislation to create a smoke-free generation by restricting the sale of tobacco so that children currently aged 14 or younger can never be sold cigarettes and restricting the sale and marketing of e-cigarettes to children. My ministers will bring forward a bill to reform the housing market by making it cheaper and easier for leaseholders to purchase their freehold and tackling the exploitation of millions of homeowners through punitive service charges. Renters will benefit from stronger security of tenure and better value, while landlords will benefit from reforms to provide certainty that they can regain their properties when needed. My government will deliver a long-term plan to regenerate towns and put local people in control of their future. Legislation will be brought forward to safeguard the future of football clubs for the benefit of communities and fans. A bill will be introduced to deal with the scourge of unlicensed pedicabs in London. My government is committed to tackling anti-Semitism and ensuring that the Holocaust is never forgotten. A bill will progress the construction of a National Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre in Victoria Tower Gardens. My government will, keep, will act to keep communities safe from crime, antisocial behaviour, terrorism and illegal migration. A bill will be brought forward to ensure tougher sentences for the most serious offenders and increase the confidence of victims. My ministers will introduce legislation to empower police forces and the criminal justice system to prevent new or complex crimes, such as digital enabled crime and child sexual abuse, including grooming. At a time when threats to national security are changing rapidly, due to new technology, my ministers will give the security and intelligence services the powers they need and will strengthen independent judicial oversight. Legislation will be introduced to protect public premises from terrorism in light of the Manchester Arena attack. My government will deliver on the Illegal Migration Act passed earlier this year and on international agreements to stop dangerous and illegal channel crossings and ensure it is the government, not criminal gangs, who decides who comes to this country. My government will continue to champion security around the world, to invest in our gallant armed forces and to support veterans to whom so much is owed. My ministers will work closely with international partners to support Ukraine, strengthen NATO, and address the most pressing security challenges. This includes the consequences of the barbaric acts of terrorism against the people of Israel, facilitating humanitarian support into Gaza and supporting the cause of peace and stability in the Middle East. My government will continue to lead action on tackling climate change and biodiversity loss, support developing countries with their energy of transition and hold other countries to their environmental commitments. The United Kingdom will continue to lead international discussions to ensure that artificial intelligence is developed safely. My government will host the Global Investment Summit, the European political community 
and the Energy Conference, leading global conversations on the United Kingdom's most pressing challenges. I look forward to welcoming His Excellency the President of the Republic of Korea and Mrs. Kim Keon Hee for a state visit later this month. My government will, in all respects, seek to make long-term decisions in the interests of future generations. My ministers will address inflation and the drivers of low growth over demands for greater spending or borrowing. My ministers will put the security of communities and the nation ahead of the rights of those who, ind who endanger it. By taking these long-term decisions, my government will change this country and build a better future. Members of the House of Commons, estimates for the public services will be laid before you. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, other measures will be laid before you. I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may rest upon your councils. So there it was, the first King's speech delivered by uh, Charles III and the Right Honourable Alex Chalk, KCMP, uh, Lord Chancellor, putting it back in the purse. We have much to discuss, Chris Mason. Yeah, this is where the politics returns, really, after the ceremony of the morning. Uh, King referring, uh, if I've done my sums right, to 16 bills there, but there are 21 of them uh, in total. I don't think anything that would amount to a rabbit, however well dressed, uh, uh, coming out of any hats. It was relatively sort of widely trailed. The principal talking points and planned bits of legislation that the government has, uh, as I say, the, the debate to follow this afternoon, and then journalistically a lot of unpicking. I'm in possession of a huge briefing pack, which I can't claim to have read every syllable of just yet, to work out which bits will apply to which corners of the United Kingdom, which nations of the United Kingdom, and which won't, which is important in, in unpicking it. And then the beginnings, as we were talking beforehand, really, of some of the tram tracks of disagreement and discussion and debate that will come in the next year between now and the and the general election some of the dividing lines that uh, that are likely to appear between the, the conservatives and others in that in that debate to come meanwhile we have the reverse procession if you like as the the king and queen and uh, the lord great chamberlain and the earl marshal and others uh, proceeded as you can see by the heralds um head back and the king and queen will go into the robing room and the uh, leave their royal regalia there and uh, then they will return to Buckingham Palace. There's Penny Mordaunt again, of course, the um, president of the council, standing beside Lord McFall, walking beside Lord McFall, who is the, uh, the Lord Speaker. He's a considerable figure in labor, labor circles, Lord McFall. He was um, chairman of the Finance Committee for many years, wasn't he? The Treasury Committee. Treasury yes, Committee. That's right, yes, mm. for, for, for a number of years, and, uh, and a Labour MP, and, mm. and then went to the House of Lords. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, honestly, this is meant to be the legislative programme well, for a whole year. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. We haven't heard... Let's hear from the representative of the governing party very, very shortly, and I'll let you kick this off, mm, okay. uh, Chris. But uh, they're heading to the robing room right now. Uh, Kirsty, just a word on what we saw. Uh, not, on what, not on what we heard, but on this. What do you think of this as you watch it? I mean, as I said earlier, it seems to be pretty far removed from, from the lives of normal people. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably costing an, an awful lot of money, but 
you know, I think it's important that we do have a speech, that there is something that sets out the legislative detail. Um, I think it's a, a sensible way to kickstart a session of Parliament. I think you could probably do it without all of the pomp and ceremony. You could do it with a bit more clarity. As Chris said, there, you know, there's 21 bills, but you know, there's only 15 or 16 of them actually laid out in that speech. So it'd be nice to have a bit more clarity about what we should be expecting over the session, a bit more commitments from the government that they're required to meet. Right. So let's kick it off with the politics, good and proper. <laughs> Uh, so, Chris, sell it to us. Well, this wasn't about electioneering, as somebody suggested earlier. This is about setting out the long-term plan for the country's future, not engaging in sort of cheap stunts or rabbits out of a hat, ermine-clad or otherwise, but about doing the serious business that will make sure this country has prosperity and security, not just for the next year, but long into the future. So we heard uh, the King's Speech talk, for example, about the economy, making sure that we're energy independent. We saw the announcement... Uh, yesterday about new drilling in the North Sea. We're going to put that onto a legislative footing so we don't have to be importing oil and gas from countries around the world that can sometimes be unreliable, which also makes the cost of living higher. Uh, we talked about trade. We've obviously recently uh, agreed to join the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership and there's legislation to underpin that that will help us trade with the world's fastest growing economies. And on technology, uh, we heard reference there to a bill that will enable us to embrace things like autonomous vehicles, uh, the Digital Markets Act that will uh, set the framework for competition going forward. And actually, the, the autonomous vehicles uh, bill is quite a good example. When I was technology minister uh, a year or two ago, um, I was being uh, spoken to by uh, a company that was developing artificially, artificial intelligence driven vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And they said, unless you legislate, unless the government legislates in the UK to set out the, the, the way we can do this legally, we're going to end up going to Germany or to the US. And here we are now legislating. Now, that won't get any headlines. I doubt you'll read about that in the newspapers tomorrow. But it's the kind of change that not just for this year, but for decades ahead, will make our country uh, competitive. Now, in terms of society, uh, you know, we heard about health measures, making sure uh, children 14 and under will never be able to buy uh, cigarettes, which are terrible uh, for their health. Obviously, now my children, I've got twins, they're 10 years old. And what that means is that my kids will not smoke. And I think, frankly, um, that is a good thing. We heard about... The, the corollary of that is that people on the right, such as Liz Truss, are not happy about that because there will come a time when uh, a 32-year-old will have to borrow a 33-year-old's ID to buy cigarettes. Yeah, well, look, you always get these edge cases, but I think, you know, the principle is quite important. That mm. Smoking uh, kills you. Yeah. Smoking causes cancer. Smoking puts a huge burden on the NHS. And I think saying that for children 14 and below, they're ne never going to smoke. You support that. That is a good thing. Don't you? Smoking? I, I support doing? several of the things that have been announced today, but this isn't a legislative programme for a year. We could get all of this done in a fortnight and then have a general election. This Nonsense. isn't... This isn't. I mean, the you whole of last year... Yes, Come on. yes, we could. Of course we could. Most of it is just tinkering. Most of this will not be a full bill of 200 pages worth that we have to go through in a committee for weeks on end. It'll be like a clause... A single clause bill. Well, the and, like, and this is exactly what we've had for the last year. Chris Mason. Let me briefly. Just, well, let me lie briefly. For the last year, the House of Commons has rose, has risen half the half the days of the year early because we haven't had enough business. Well, this government has run out of steam. It's run out of ideas, and, and we should have a well, general election. Well, on the on the House rising, it's not the government's fault that uh, opposition MPs can't be bothered to debate measures. Uh, it is thoroughly. you determine we how long we well, sit. We, ha we haven't even we haven't even talked about the Crime and Justice Bill, which is far from being a one clause or two clause bill, as Chris Bryant was uh, erroneously suggesting. This is going to be a substantial piece of legislation setting out how we're going to protect the public. It's a load of gimmicks. So, nonsense, absolute nonsense. You know, keeping rapists in prison for the entirety of their sentence, extending whole yeah, life so orders, just remind taking hand on a just take, a few take, weeks giving ago, the police, giving the police powers just a few uh, weeks to go ago, after criminals uh, who are using technology to exploit vulnerable people. These are not gimmicks, these are fundamentally So you're in favour of longer sentences for prisoners. OK, fine. However, I would just point out that only a few weeks ago you were telling magistrates that they couldn't send people to prison and they had to slow down on the process because there aren't enough places in prison. Uh, that's not what the Lord Chancellor said. He said he was talking about very short sentences, which are sometimes uh, not effective. For serious criminals, we're talking about putting them in prison for longer, and that is what I think the public would expect to see. We haven't got the prison places to put them in. We're building new prison and, places and the at the rate of 100 a week. And the criminal justice is falling apart. 90% of, uh, of crimes that were committed last year Kirsty. were not investigated yeah. by the police. Kirsty, um, what's, so what's, what's, uh, oh, I was going to say, what's in this for Scotland? Do you know but, what? Um, well, actually, there's an awful lot of it's England, Wales only, or England only. Well, we have or, the um, oil. You're, you're, uh, not, you're you know, an 
Aberdeen MP, of there course. Is, there is so there's a lot of jobs in oil in your constituency. So that's tricky for you, isn't it? There is stuff in terms of energy security, mm. and I think it's important, particularly it talks about the um, reform of the grid and changes there that are required in order, for example, the, um, the new offshore wind to actually be able to get connected to the grid. That's one of the key things that people are telling me in terms of renewables. In terms of the new license, and actually, you know, we need to make sure that all of that is checked in terms of climate compatibility. Actually, the new licenses that have been granted um, by the Conservatives over the last few years in power, um, over the last 10 years, 13 years in power, have only resulted in six weeks of gas for the UK um, being taken Would you out put a moratorium on granting I, new licences? I think, I think what should happen in relation to that is we should be looking at every single one and working out whether or not that granting of that licence does what it says on the tin. Does it improve the energy security? Does taking more oil out of the North Sea improve the energy security for the UK? And actually 75% of that is exported. So you can't reasonably argue that that's the case. Um, so you need to look at actually the impact on the climate of that. And at the, the conflict how will that assessment be made? But the, 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 conf sorry, the confidence, I'll just finish what I was saying there, the confidence that is required from the renewable sector, if you look at the recent contracts for difference uh, round that there was in terms of, of wind, um, you know, it's not working. There are real issues. The government needs to be clear that it is absolutely behind its climate change commitments and give confidence to the renewables industry because the U-turns and the comments that Rishi Sunak is making are really causing problems for that industry. People don't want to invest in the UK just now because of the comments of the Prime Minister. So I'm concerned that the wrong direction is mm. being taken here. Everybody mm. knows oil and gas is winding in, whether or not new licences are granted, but we need renewables to ramp up. But it's, up it's massive, it's massive for jobs in Aberdeen, isn't it? Is it is very so, important but, jobs in Aberdeen. Okay, this is, uh, Chris Mason, this is, this is a dividing line, isn't it? Yeah, it is, absolutely, about how the country goes about approaching those commitments to, to net zero and how you make an argument where you can take <coughs> the electorate with you about how you do that and how you use or not the remaining oil and gas in the North Sea. The government creating this dividing line because Labour are opposed to it, this idea of this annual round of licences for oil. Well, what would Labour do about new licences? No more? Well, they're saying that they wouldn't have any more, Chris will contradict me if I get, get this wrong, any right. more beyond those that are <laughs> licensed at the point that, that Labour were to assume government. But Kirsty from the Scottish National Party says we, we might have them, but we'd have to assess all the implications, the environmental effects of them. And, and there lies the debate, the yeah. roaring return of politics. And there's another problem in this, which is that a lot of the oil that we're talking about in these licences is, heavy, is much heavier oil, um, mm. and British refineries can't deal with it. Um, as um, a new report out in the last week shows. So, I, look, I want a green future for our country. I, I think that our, our energy independence lies in really kick-starting the green energy in this country. That means, of course, we should have shorted out the, the connections with the grid six years ago. We shouldn't be d getting round to it now. The government's been there for 13 years and it's been asleep at the wheel. Well, a couple of points. I mean, on the, look, we all agree we want to make a transition to net zero and have more renewable energy. I mean, I think our renewable energy uh, percentage has gone from, it was like 2 or 3% under the last Labour government. We're up to, I think, it's over 25% today. So huge progress has been made. In now, that transition, years. that transit was a huge, huge increase under this government. Now, I think everyone understands... Years. I think everyone understands... A huge increase. I think everyone understands um, that we are going to need oil and gas for some years to come as we make the transition. Now, the choice is, do we import that uh, from countries around the world, some of which are unreliable? It is expensive and it's bad for the environment. If we import, for example, gas from Qatar, you have to liquefy that gas, stick it onto a massive ship, sail it through the Suez Canal, across the Bay of Biscay to Milford Haven, uh, de-liquefy it, which is a very energy-intensive process, and stick it into a pipe. Now, it is not only cheaper, but also more environmentally friendly to pump that out of the North Sea for so long as we need gas. So these measures, and, 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 these, measures, and, these measures are very And, Kirsty, this is, this is a very emotional debate, this one, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, it's really important to people as well. You know, actually, if you speak to younger people particularly, the biggest issue that they're concerned about, second to cost of living, is climate change. Mm. Is, you know, what are we doing about this? And as I said already, the Prime Minister's wavering around on this and his, um, his extreme levels of commitments to fossil fuels, it seems, is not speaking to that younger part of the electorate. We're not on track to meet our targets. No. We're not on track to meet our targets. And this is the most important issue for the next generation. 
in. But if you look, if you look at our um, CO2 emissions, right, per capita, they've been consistently declining, actually under both the previous Labour government and the Conservative government in the 1990s and the current government in the last 13 years. And the progress we've made in this country, the United Kingdom, reducing our CO2 emissions is, I think, you know, better than almost but, any but other G7 near, country. It's nowhere near enough, and you know it's not. And, and every young person in this country knows it's not. The other thing that affects a lot of young people, and something that is completely absent from the King's speech today, is, is housing. We need to build more houses oh, in this country. We need to kickstart... No, no, we need to build one and a half million houses over the next five years. And Labour's the only party who's got an ambition and a determination <laughs> to do that. Chris Phil, housing. You, you've well, well, let's get a response. Let's, let's, get a response. Well, let's talk about housing. It's very important to so, many so, people watching so, this. So, now. first of all, I'm not sure I'm in the market for taking lessons from Chris Bryant. The last Labour government saw a house building collapse to the lowest level since the 1920s. We can I start, can we go back to another house, a very grand house, uh, which is where we are at the moment, because the King and Queen are uh, leaving and saying their farewells um, to the Chief of Defence Staff there and moving along the line after the first King's speech by King Charles III with uh, Queen Camilla beside him. And um, quite a day, Chris Mason, quite a day for him. Absolutely, yeah. You, th you think of the, the number of years that he must have watched on and imagined these moments of uh, assuming the crown that would come to him one day. And there are a diminishing number of firsts, aren't there, for him in, in performing the role as Mark making this? There's the old marshal. First chance for him to do it and, uh, properly in the role. Alex Chalk there, the uh, Lord Chancellor. How interesting if the King were to take a diversion, come up here and sit with us and join our discussion about the future of the <laughs> oil well, industry. Well, Which bits he would have given a gold tick to? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, would, uh, that would be interesting. So he's back in his... Alex uh, Chalk would have been relieved not to have tripped over yeah. as he walked backwards down those it, it was It was deft, yeah, wasn't it? He'd have been practising that, probably. So yeah. in 2001, I went to the first of these uh, as an MP and um, I... It was the last time they had the hereditary countesses and things like that, all dressed in their kind of finery, and tiaras. And I turned to somebody who I thought was also a, a, a new Labour MP and said, where do you buy a tiara like that? Uh, it turned out he was a Conservative, and he said to me, you don't buy a tiara, you inherit a tiara. Oh, this is, this is like you, you, you're someone who buys their own furniture. How terrible. It's a bit of that. But listen, uh, I, was, I was bringing the Scottish angle earlier on, uh, Kirsty, because we, we do have a, our own great uh, royal traditions. And I did say that the first time the sword of, sword of state was used at a coronation was by James II. And I said, and I hope you... Yeah, I said James II and seventh. Fabulous. I thank you. Uh, thank you for I'm that very earlier on. glad that you recognise that that was the case. Of course I recognise it. And of course, James II, uh, the brother of Charles II, the son of Charles I, who was the, the son... Never mind that. Uh, the son of, <laughs> son of Charles I, who was the son of James I and VI. And so he was oh. the great grandson of Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots. Very impressive. Thank you. Very that, impressive. Uh, your, your and they're saying they're good. Is brilliant. Yeah, well, it's Scottish history. You know, we have our part to play. Well, and they're Indeed. all in the in, in the mm. prince's chamber that you referred to. There, it's mm. not just the Tudors; they also mm. have the Stuarts because mm. obviously uh, the connection. Um, and, and interestingly, of course, Henry VIII's older brother is also in the list. That's right. Arthur, Prince of Wales, oh, is up there as well. well. And Catherine of Aragon, <laughs> national anthem and trumpeters. This is the fanfare. Get back in the Golden Jubilee State Coach. Diamond Jubilee State Coach, I do beg your pardon. And as the coach passes the Guard of Honour, we will once more hear the national anthem.
And now we're seeing the Imperial State Crown departing and the Royal Regalia. Cap of Maintenance, the Sword of State. Imperial State Crown, carried by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Vernon and delivered into the Queen Alexandra State Coach. Mr. Appleby, the Crown Jeweller, handing over the Sword of State. And there's the cap of maintenance. Never worn, only held. And the Crown Jeweller taking the Imperial State Crown from Michael Vernon in readiness for its return. The next time we see Imperial State Crown will be at, um, I'm very sure, the next state opening of Parliament. When will that be, Chris Mason? <laughs> <laughs> now, there is a question. Uh, well, it will be uh, after the next uh, general election, mm -hmm. whenever that is. And uh, when is that, Chris Mason? Well, we know it's going to be before the end of January <laughs> of the year after next, but beyond that, who knows? I think most of the smart money at the moment suggests uh, next autumn at some point. Mm -hmm. Well, for those of you who enjoy all the, the, the pomp and the pageantry and the, and the history, um, it was quite something, wasn't it? And a, a, a quick word, we're going to speak to Tina De Healy, who's in the central lobby in just a second, but I just a, a quick word to the people who work so hard to organise and arrange what we've just seen. It takes weeks to make it all come together. And a word for Sarah Clark, the uh, Lady Usher of the Black Rod, who also is in charge of business resilience and, and access. She's a sergeant at arms, secretary to the Lord Great Chamberlain, and she and her team have done um, whatever you think of it. They have done an absolutely magnificent job. Um, Can we add just thanks to the police and armed services who also support mm, this event? Absolutely. Police minister, I should, it, I should say that. And on, a, on election night, whenever that election comes, I know that they all watch the um, exit polls with great interest uh, to see when is our next one going to be, because they think if there's uh, going to be a minority, if there's going to be horse trading, and when do we have to start organising? So Horse trading? Um, <laughs> well, but it's interesting that normally the one after a general election ends up being slightly slimmed down because it has to be organised very quickly. Yeah, OK. Let's go to the central lobby. Be more political uh, reaction there from Tina. Tina De Healy is there. Nikki, I'm joined by Wendy Chamberlain from the Liberal Democrats, Liz Savile Roberts from Plaid Cymru, and Caroline Lucas from the Green Party. Let's get your reaction then to the King's speech. What did you make of the government's top priorities? I think, frankly, it's a Conservative government that has run out of ideas. On the NHS, we heard about a workforce plan, but nothing about actually alleviating the lack of access to GP appointments or our waiting times in A&Es that we're seeing. Nothing on sewage and our damage to our waterways alongside a rowing back on environmental protections. In the weeks after, we've seen severe flooding across the UK, including in my own constituency. And on criminal justice, we know that system is creaking at the seams but the government seem want to add more to it rather than necessarily helping the police and the criminal justice system more widely deliver. Frankly, it, it seems like they're waiting for a general election. Maybe they should just get on and deliver one. What was in it for Plaid Cymru? It seemed to me very much like a last-ditch King's speech for a last-ditch government. And, of course, when we're out talking to people, people are talking about the cost of living crisis, the cost of inequality crisis. And there was nothing in that here. Even if they're talking about crime and punishment, we know this is a government that has cut, cut, cut the, the budget for prisons and probation by 11% in real terms in the last 13 years. And for Wales, what I would like to see was more means for our five-point plan 
for increasing support in welfare, for making sure that our natural resources pay back to the people of Wales, that justice is managed according to our values in Wales, and that actually there are real ways of supporting people. Where was the mention of a social tariff for energy? The things that would have made a real difference to people this winter. What we have was more diversive politics. The, the, the speech did mention a new system for granting oil and gas licences to strengthen energy security. What did you make of that? Well, in all honesty, this is just talking to the home audience for the Tories. They're desperate to energise their own supporters. We know that is desperately insufficient. We know that we need an entirely different energy mix into the future, and that wasn't touched upon here. Caroline Lucas, what was in it for you? Well, it was pretty thin gruel, wasn't it? I mean, no big ideas, no big vision. And when it came to that centrepiece bill about oil and gas, it simply won't do what the Prime Minister claims. He says it's going to increase energy security. We know any oil and gas that's got out of the North Sea will simply be sold on global markets to the highest bidder. He says that it's going to help homeowners with their energy bills. His own Secretary of State yesterday admitted she let the cat out of the bag when she said that, frankly, it's not going to improve people's fuel bills. So what we need to see is an end to this governing by gimmick, an end to these weaponising of issues like climate change for the Prime Minister's culture wars. He needs to start demonstrating that he believes in something and when it comes to energy what he should have been doing is unleashing that huge potential in energy efficiency and renewable energy. That is the way to keep people's fuel bills down, to have real energy security and crucially to tackle the climate crisis as well. Thank you all. Well, we're going to be going back to Central Lobby very soon. Tina will have uh, more political reaction there. So we haven't got a lot of time, but Chris, you've been scouring the document, you've been reading the speech. Energy, clearly, oil is going to be a massive headline here. Anything else, uh, very quickly, that's caught your eye? So, yeah, 21 bills. Big question, how many can the government deliver between now and the general election? Which ones form the main arguments between the parties. We've got a brief insight to that as far as the uh, offshore petroleum licensing bill uh, is concerned. And then which ones, I guess, have the potential just to become something that happens and becomes an established kind of part of our kind of legislative history. And I just wonder on the phasing out of cigarettes for younger people, that raising of the legal limit, which devolved administrations around the UK broadly are on board but with... Disquiet on the Tory right. right. There is some disquiet on the Conservative right. Might just become one of those things that, that happens and becomes a kind of a, a thing, a thing that is there. And if you think back to the banning of smoking in public places, other things that, that a government can do, that there's a bit of an argument about at the time, and then just happens and becomes a becomes an established can they beyond go on the other things where there's big arguments. Hang on, Chris. Can, can, uh, tell the Chris, our oh, Chris, BBC's Chris. Uh, can we... <laughs> my favourite Chris. Uh, can Ooh, we... Oh, <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 there are, the there are many competitors <laughs> for that crown. Uh, so, uh, can they get all this stuff done in a year? <laughs> they could do it in a fortnight. I mean, Honestly, nonsense, it is, is, it is a very, very thin <laughs> legislative uh, programme. A fortnight is nonsense, though, that isn't is it? Nonsense. It could all be done by Christmas. All right, a fortnight is exaggeration, but it could all be done by Christmas. I mean, that's because, because there's loads of stuff where there is agreement on Let's both sides. Let's go get it all back agreed. to Central Lobby for our favourite seat, to our favourite Tina, who's been joined by some more guests. Thank you very much, Nikki. Yes, now I'm joined by Carla Lockhart from the DUP, Colin Eastwood from the SDLP and Dr Stephen Parry from the Alliance Party. You were all in the chamber listening to the King's speech. Carla Lockhart, what were you hoping for? Well, obviously, there are a number that, of things that we would welcome, particularly around the criminal justice system, around digital uh, marketing and competition, protecting our consumers. We'd have liked to have heard a little more on help for the cost of living crisis, particularly around childcare, tax-free childcare, uh, uh, how they're going to address inflation. So lots of issues there that I think they could have explored and given us more detail. But welcome uh, some of the, the, the initiatives today that have been put forward. Well, I think we've been waiting for a long time for legislation from the DUP and this government. They've privatised a process around the restoration of Stormont. It hasn't come today. And I think it's time now the DUP realise it's time to get back to work, deal with the crisis in the health service in Northern Ireland and get on with it because this government is clearly not interested. Are you worried about losing seats at the next general election if power sharing isn't restored at Stormont? Well, within the King's speech today, rarely do you hear the devolved nations uh, mentioned. Uh, so we weren't expecting anything in the King's speech. The negotiations continue with the DUP and the UK government about restoring our rightful place within the NDP.
internal market of the, the UK. And within the speech today, there is uh, mention about promoting the union and uh, strengthening the social fabric. So we look forward to continuing those engagements and seeing a reformed uh, Stormont that is stable and that is able to perform. OK, let's come to you, uh, Dr Stephen Parry. Your reaction to the King's speech? Well, I think it's strong on, on skills, but very weak on, on climate change. And that, that has to be a, a long-term worry. Very disappointed that the, the, the long-promised bill on, on conversion authority has been dropped. That's now uh, promised in previous speeches, hasn't materialised. Uh, and in terms of Northern Ireland, uh, no mention at all, which really shows that it's up to us in Northern Ireland to sort this out. Um, the UK government have other concerns, and, and uh, Northern Ireland is not at the centre of their, their attention. So it's time we actually get back to work in terms of the Northern Ireland Assembly. And hopefully, as well, the government will end what's now becoming the culture wars that, that, that they're fueling, forcing divisions in the society. I think it has, it has to stop, and hopefully, there will be some time for reflection on that. OK, thank you all for speaking to us. Thank you. Well, we've had some, uh, some lively debate in the, and thanks to Tina there, uh, we've had some lively debate in the studio about some of the issues in the King's speech. And uh, as we're heading towards the end, uh, Chris, what happens now? What happens for the rest of the day in there? They just go into the House of Commons and have a debate, do they? They do in a couple of hours' mm. time. So there's a tradition at the beginning where a few backbenchers uh, offer a contribution, which is that uh, it's quite, quite, quite a hard thing to write, I imagine, actually, because it's, it's meant to be funny, basically, which isn't easy. So a couple of backbenchers do a bit of that. And then you get into the, into the, the meat of the political discussion. We'll hear from the Prime Minister, we'll hear from Keir Starmer for Labour, we'll hear from the Scottish National Party and others. And then the debate will carry on until what about 10 o'clock tonight and carry on for the sort of subsequent days starting to pick away at chisel away at debate and discuss and uh, enlighten uh, on the various uh, on the various bills that the that the house will then start kicking around mm. and you see various dividing lines in there very quickly 10 seconds yeah there's, there's definitely that there are there are ones where there are fewer dividing lines and then ones where there really are and that will form at least okay. part of the the pre-election discussion well thanks to all the chris's and the kirsty thanks to all my guests uh, that's an end to our program for today it is an absolutely momentous day for the British state and I hope you enjoyed all the, the pageantry and the performance and the phantasmagoria and the tradition but it's a massive day for the state of British politics coverage of the debate on the King's speech will continue next on BBC Two with Politics Live from all of us at the BBC the team here thank you for watching goodbye <laughs>